Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Asha, Roshan, and everyone else in the class. Tarun, Abhinash, Kumbilu, Shikumar, Sedan, Kennedy, and there are other, several others here. Elisha and Shrikumar and yeah, good Kennedy as well. Good. Let's uh, take a moment to pray. Get started. Maggie, you're gonna pray. Oh, not sure. Okay, maybe somebody else could pray. Oh, so a second. I can pray. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Lord Jesus, we thank you, Father, that we live in, in the age that we have technology at disposal. Uh, we can reach nations, we can use it to address your kingdom, to preach your word. We pray. Give us more understanding, give us more vision. In our pastor teaches us so that we can you know, work, you know, work forward, Lord, in a way that is relevant and that's the way that is effective, Lord, to our generation. We must be with Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Rowan. Welcome to the class. So, um, we are talking about media and technology and um, in this section, I'm just kind of reviewing, you know, we could say where things are at the at the current state and kind of just giving us also a little background on how things have evolved over time to bring us to where we are. Last class, we talked about the preaching of the word and we kind of just looked at, you know, back in Bible times, um, People preached for hours, uh, or yeah, preached for hours. They didn't have, you know, the kinds of things we had. Uh, they basically had to use words to capture everything and communicate everything. And so, you know, we, we you know, Jesus spoke for three days. Paul spoke over the overnight, and you know, it went on like that. And then we see we come to where we are today, where. Um, uh, the way we communicate, it's the same message, the Word of God. But, you know, we have so many things available to us to communicate. Uh, uh, but at the same time, we have to be relevant to our audience, speak in the language that they can understand, communicate spiritual truth, put it in, in a way that they will be able to receive it. And today, of course, uh, we see that uh, in some places, uh, sermons are maybe 15, 20 minutes long. Uh, sometimes, you know, we've gone down to even giving 30-second uh, bursts of messages, uh, one-minute messages, five-minute messages, all kinds of things we have going on today. But, you know, it's all uh, us adapting to uh, today's world, but we're communicating timeless truth. We're just presenting it in different ways and different forms that people can com consume today. So in keeping with that same trend, uh, we're going to look at several things. We're going to look at today, we're looking at the gathering place, uh, how that has changed. We're going to look at music, how that has changed. And we can, basically, I want us to think about what's the good and the bad of where we are today. You know, so things have changed. And of course, these... Uh, adaptations have taken place for good reason, meaning in order to be relevant uh, and to be meaningful to the world today. So we have changed. But then at the same time, we have to be careful about, okay, you know, we don't want to, we have to be careful that we don't want to go off into something that is erroneous while we have made effort to adapt and be relevant to the current world and so we'll cover a few more things next week uh, tomorrow we'll talk about you know how uh, other areas in which uh, we can 
use media and technology to communicate, you know, movies and online and so forth. And then we'll, after that, we kind of get into, you know, um, more in depth on specific technologies that we can use and how to use it and so on. Okay. But right now, we're kind of doing an, uh, you know, a, an, a journey, a journey study of several things. Today, we'll talk about the gathering place. And let's just, you know, spend a little bit of time to see how this has evolved uh, in order to be relevant to today's world and also to make use of technologies that are available. The place where God's people gather for worship, for being in the Word, and for fellowship, the gathering place. How has that changed? So when you go back in time, uh, it used to be the tabernacle and the temple that people came to. And they came, <clears throat> and I'm going back in the Old Testament, where people, you know, they brought their offerings, they, they came to worship, <clears throat> sorry, they came to worship God. And uh, you can think about, you know, the tabernacle during David's time, where they sang and they worshiped God continuously, you know. Um, David had these musicians and psalmists, and so they used all the musical equipments and they sang, and many of the psalms were written, and the people worshipped, you know, in a, in a tabernacle. So you can think of a very tent, a tent-like structure where they came and worshipped. Of course, it was organized in the outer court, the inner court, in the most holy place, and so on. And then he had the physical temple, Solomon built it. And then later on, you know, we... As we come into the New Testament, we have these smaller synagogues, places where people gathered to be taught. And then the early church, they primarily met in homes. You know, they, they used synagogues where they could. They used maybe even school places. Uh, so Paul would preach in schools. If he was driven out of the synagogue, he would preach in the school. Uh, but then they also predominantly use homes. So that was the gathering place. And then over time, we have we had the church buildings. So this was land and buildings built where people gathered together. And of course, the buildings themselves became a statement of worship. So the way the buildings were designed, the way they were built, they were an expression of magnificence they were, they were an expression of you know they're trying to capture something something about god and something about man coming to seek god so you know we have all these cathedrals and all of those things that happened and then what we see subsequently is uh, uh, and, I, and i'm just you know jumping over time here and uh, uh, especially in the 70s a while uh, there were all these open air crusades, you know, big gospel crusades being preached in open fields and tents and stadiums. As far as the weekly gathering place was happening, we see a lot of teaching centers springing up, meaning people said, Look, it's not about these fancy uh, or these majestic cathedrals that's important, it's about what happens inside the place that's important. So, you know, people just rented warehouses or even smaller sh shopping places, whatever, you know, and, and converted it into a place where people gather. So we had lots of teaching centers. They'd be called the Word Center, the Grace Center. They usually, some center, you know, you had these springing up everywhere. And these are just simple places people gather to worship and so on. But then from there, we we saw you know people buying land building amazing buildings and the whole shift went into the experience that what 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 do you experience when you come inside the building you know and a lot of technology came into the building you know so i'm just going to you know for, uh, for, for momentarily just going to show a few things online now many of you have already seen this or probably you're part of churches where all this happens so it's not new 
uh, and remember a lot of these things are in the context of the urban church but it's just just for the sake of completeness um, I'm going to uh, go online just share a few things uh, that we can see online let me okay Let me just open these pages. All right. So, um, I'm just getting this thing up um, so we can look at it. Um, yeah. Share the screen. All right, so yeah, I'm just sharing my screen. So, you know, uh, and this is just a website here, Church Stage Design Ideas, uh, you know, just to show you, just for us to have a quick look at, you know, so how the entire, you know, the inside of the church facility now suddenly took on uh, a new form, you know. Previously, the church buildings were very ornate with the stained glass windows and high altars and, you know, nice dome and chair, I mean, uh, pews and so on. And then here we are today, uh, we've just got so many different kinds of, you know, the stage is set up in a very different way, uh, using a lot of contemporary things uh, you could have lights and LEDs but there's a small place or you know you, a lot of a lot of designs available and uh, you know Sunday to Sunday we could change the decor the look of the stage so imagine this is this is a church a place where you're coming to worship God and suddenly it's taking on you know a different um, expression uh, the same stage, the same the interior of the building is taking on uh, a different expression uh, with lights and decor and so on and so forth. A lot, lot of things are there. And you can, you know, some of you probably are part of churches where, you know, they make effort to, to make the whole stage and experience look great. And, uh, and in some places, you know, uh, of course, some are still traditional. And some are very contemporary, right? So uh, we have that going on today in today's church. the The contemporary church gathering venue is uh, has. Uh, let me just share the PDF. Go back to what we're talking about. Has uh, evolved and it's has changed uh, quite a bit. And then, along with technology that, that came into the venue was the internet. So what happened? Previously, one local church, if it wanted to do missions, it would send out a church planting team and they would physically plant a church, some other part, maybe in the city or some other somewhere else. And that's how you see even in the Book of Acts, people physically went and planted churches. But suddenly, with with the with the availability of technology, they said, "Hey, uh, what we are experiencing? Yeah, we can live stream. Uh, we can connect to other church location, other facilities, and expand what we're doing." 
And I think the 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 pioneer in all of this was Yonggi Cho, uh, because he started doing it back in the 1980s. Now he started doing it out of necessity, in the sense uh, when when in Seoul, Korea, when he uh, built his church facility, I think it was sitting seating about six seven thousand people. And when they could not hold any more people in that building, they just connected another building through television. You know, so okay, there's another facility, and it's like an extension. Now, what the some sermon, sermon, sermon that's preached here is going to be uh, relayed into that facility, and people can listen and watch on a big on a screen in that facility. So. He, he did it out of necessity, so soon there were multiple buildings connected to the main building through television, and the numbers could multiply. So he could have, you know, he would have 10 services, but each service could have 10,000, 15,000, large numbers of people. So back in the 80s, he started doing this. But now when we come into the... Um, 21st century, uh, churches, and this again because of the internet, uh, began to live stream and set up satellite churches even in other cities. Right? So from one church, you could connect to other facilities in the same city, or you could set up churches in other cities. So some some of the you know prominent churches that are doing this, a life church, an elevation church, I think these 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 churches have, you know, I, I don't know what the numbers are, but maybe 15 cities plus, you know, they're connected. So um, they uh, they what is being you know the experience in one could be live streamed into multiple churches shared in multiple if they want to uh, and then they have local campus pastors and all of that doing this taking care of the local people the ministry there and in addition to actually live streaming churches they came up with a, a process to make this happen so you actually initially start out with small groups so they call them efam groups or something where if there's a you know a few people gathering and watching the service at home, okay, you start off with a family group, a small group, and then eventually the numbers increase. That would then become one of their satellite churches or one of their live stream churches. So it's an interesting thing that you know, in times past, you would send people out physically and plant churches, do all of that, and here we are today with technology, we're able to connect in real time. Uh, multiple locations, not only in the same city, but multiple locations in many cities. And um, and I think uh, um, Kingdom City does it across continents. Kingdom City uh, from Australia, I think, yeah. So they have, they connect across you know, Malaysia and Singapore and um, other places. So they connect and it's amazing what they're doing with technology. Uh, connecting all of these locations. So uh, again, that's that's another church that is leveraging technology to have or establish satellite churches across continents. Uh, they're doing that. So we've gone from you know the temple and the synagogue as and the and the, and the homes as a gathering place today to satellite churches to um, the venue being done up with so much of media and technology happening. And uh, within that, again, Yonggi Cho was a pioneer uh, in terms of uh, doing multiple multi-language service. So he had people, of course, in those days they had uh, they didn't have the same technology we have today, but he had people doing real-time translation into various languages and gave people headsets and they could all connect in different frequencies and listen to the sermon in a different language through the headsets. But you're all sitting inside the same building. 
right, in the same gathering place. And that, of course, he, he pioneered that. And then today, we can have that done through wireless headsets, and we can uh, have even have that done even through um, uh, natural language translation. So that means through through a completely software-driven system, uh, your video or your preaching is translated real time through software into other languages. Now, obviously, having a person do it would be ideal, but you don't always have to have a person. You could use it completely on a software-driven basis where the preaching is being translated real-time into other languages. So uh, that is also happening, where the gathering place has now evolved into something so different. Uh, the experience is, you know, it's... it's um, what do you say? It's something that captivates the audience. The experience is something that is even tailored to the audience. You can, you're able to listen if you want in your own language. I'm not saying all churches are doing it. I'm just saying churches that are on the cutting edge are doing this. The experience is such that you are could be in one city, but the preacher is actually preaching to you from some other part of the world. And it's as though he's standing in front of you. Right, uh, it's uh, uh, and and the way Kingdom City does it is they actually actually have worship teams in different parts of the world, but when it is presented, it's like, hey, it's as though the worship team is all in one place, but actually you could have three different worship teams. They're all singing together in sync, and the person seeing it feels like you're in the same room, but you're actually on three different parts of the world, three different cities, and it's it's just really amazing what's happening. Uh, all you know, all leveraging technology. So this is where things are, and uh, it's great that churches are being using this for the extension of God's kingdom. And if you go to Life Church and Elevation Church, and they list out all the cities where they have their churches and EFAM groups and all of that. So the question is this: How much of this is good? How much of this is not good? And what are the dangers we should avoid? You know, if you look at where this whole church, local church service experience is going and what is happening, uh, it's very likely that more and more urban churches are going to adopt the use of media and technology in the worship church experience. It's most likely that's what's going to happen. So that's the direction things are going. But then we have to ask ourselves the question, what is good? What is not good? What are the dangers we should avoid? And I just want to open it up for some discussion. I want to hear your thoughts on this. And maybe you know we can learn from each other. If you've had some experience in this as well, please feel free to share. Uh, uh, is everyone with me? What we are talking about, what we've in this chat in lesson number five. Okay. So please share your thoughts. Um and the use, you know, in this gathering place experience, you know, where things are now, and you know, where certain churches that they're on the cutting edge, what is good, what is not good, and what what should we be careful about? I'd like to hear your thoughts, please. Okay, Pastor, can I speak? Please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much. I think um, this new the use of technology to organize people for ministry is is novelty is good it is still helping us for the it's helping the church to meet its goal of equipping however i i believe that we should tread cautiously so that we don't lose the essence of uh, physical fellowship when we meet online um the because we have met uh, in person over time we are accustomed with it so this new online meetings is kind of making us lose some essence of uh, in-person fellowship 
and I believe we we sometimes have to blend the two so that we don't we don't lose the essence of in-person fellowship. So we can do that hybrid system where we benefit from both virtual meetings and in-person meetings. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Please go ahead, say, and then Christopher, please share your thoughts. Yeah, just to add to what Umbrella Lasha has mentioned just now, um, I, I believe the, the technology and the internet in general has, you know, helped in us realizing uh, the command of Jesus telling us to take the, the gospel to the ends of the earth and, uh, you know, reaching out to all the whole earth, basically, people who are in remote places. And we know now very well that even in rural areas, even though our study here is mainly on the urban centers, even in rural areas now, people have access to the internet, people have access to social media, you know, and it, it will keep growing, it will keep go, expanding. Um, mm. So I think it has had a positive impact, you know, in us utilizing technology and the internet, you know, to reach, uh, to reach out to people. I think the place of technology, or, or let me say internet specifically, is that um, I think it should be utilized by the church for people who are out of their reach. I think more emphasis, like Verilisha mentioned, should be on those who are within reach to always gather, basically. Um, there is a huge difference being online and there's a huge difference between being online and actually being physically in church. Um, when you see people, it does something to you spiritually, physically, emotionally, you seeing people, you interacting with people. It's not just about the message being shared. It's also about the community where we find ourselves. So I think the place of the internet, you know, when ministries are engaging it, they should also still emphasize the engagement of people. Nothing beats physical connection. Nothing beats it at all. Um, it, it, it will always be, no matter what happens, it will always be, and I, I think it should never be discouraged. At the same time, we should use the internet as much as we can, you know, to spread the gospel, to reach out to people in healing. Healing, healing has no medium. It can go through the internet and people can get healed, you know. So we can do anything on the internet, but we should never take out the place of the ingathering of the saints. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see the comments in the chat. There's Kennedy who says, you know, it helps us cross the language barrier, saves time, you know, against distance. That's important. Uh, Roshan says, yeah, you know, it helps us reach new people, uh, but we need to gather in person. Good. Christopher? Uh, yes, I, I, I think um, Say is actually was was uh, you know, kind of saying the same things. Um, I was going to say the same things that Say was saying, because I think there's no way that, you know, the gospel is going to reach so, you know, every corner of the world unless we have something like a technology which uh, you know, that, the, that the internet is actually providing. Um, so definitely the internet is very important. Um, my, my, my only thing is that, um, uh, you know, although there is uh, you know, definitely um, a need for, you know, the personal um, uh, being, you know, personally being, you know, in, in a part of a, you know, physically present in a church, uh, I still think that there is scope for, within the internet to engage more with, you know, with uh, with people. So, um, uh, you know, there is, uh, I mean, for example, uh, in, a, in a completely different forum, you know, when before there was, you know, like a uh, messaging tool like Twitter um, or Twitter like um, uh, messaging tools, where there is a lot of, you know, engagement. Uh, and uh, obviously, there are there are you know pitfalls over there where you know the uh, content uh, may may not always be uh, relevant. But if it is very specific around, uh, you know, uh, like let's put it this way, like a religious kind of Twitter, and there is a, there's a lot of engagement, uh, and also a need to you know to for people to actually you know keep going going back. You know, there's a very high level of stickiness for people to go back 
to that uh, to that tool uh, i think that will really help uh, and it could also have some ai elements to it uh, you know uh, you know maybe like uh, chat uh, gpt gpt which will you know which will allow people to to uh, you know um, ask for um, content and for the ai tool to to uh, work within a within a certain boundary and uh, you know provide a, a lot of um, you know feedback uh, and guidance perhaps you know Mm. So uh, I just think that there's there's a, there is still a lot of scope over there, and uh, you know um, there will be uh, I think there will be a there will there will be some some people who will who will design such a tool which will uh, which will make things a lot more uh, more lot more uh, effective. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, uh, did you want to say something, or is is that uh, no? No, sorry. I just put that mistake down. All right, okay. All right. So, um, yeah. So, and thank you for sharing your thoughts. And um, just thinking about this gathering place. Um, some of the time, sometimes I'm share some things to think about. You know, sometimes the focus of our efforts can can get misplaced we can put too much attention on the experience you know uh you know uh, uh just you know they, now we you know we have the lights we have the led displays we have uh, all kinds of things happening you know like for example even in in our simple setup that we have in church uh it's pretty complicated in the sense you, you go to the back room and you know the number of computers that are there sitting in the green room and uh, this is a Sunday morning service uh, but we've got all these LED displays inside on the stage uh, we've got people controlling the lights people controlling the in-house audio people controlling the audio for the live stream uh, people controlling the projection on the different LED screens people controlling the projection on the live stream so you, you know there's a real big team of people sitting in the green room controlling all this uh, to give people a good experience. Now, all of it is good. But sometimes, uh, it, we have to be careful that our focus doesn't shift to, oh, I want, people, I want people to have an exciting experience. And that could be a dangerous thing. You know, then where the focus of everybody doing the work, sometimes including the pastor and the ministry ministers becomes let's give people and you know an an awesome experience with using all of this technology media tools that we have rather than saying look we want people to encounter god we want people to worship god we want people to receive the word of god and we will use the lights and the LEDs and all the displays, we will use that just to make it easy for people to understand the word. You know, so there is a fine line that we must not cross. And even I, you know, when I work with our media team and all of that, I try to, you know, just remind them, hey guys, yeah, be minimalistic in a sense, you know. Use, yeah, it's good we have the LEDs and we have the graphics and we have the lights and all that. Hey, keep it simple. Enough so that people have something visually and experientially, but the focus is always on they must encounter God, they must pay attention to the Word of God, and, you know, worship God. So that is something we must avoid that is becoming you know the, the focus becomes on what an experience i've given people rather than have we have they encountered god you know and in some cases you can see that uh, people just go overboard in the use of all of these tools that we have and the, the drive is on, let's make each experience better than the previous Sunday. And, uh, you know, uh, the focus has shifted from the 
the ministry of the word and the work of the spirit to giving a great media experience. So we have to be very careful of that. The other thing that I also want us to think about in this whole use of technology for satellite churches and all that is to be careful that the focus doesn't become on one man. You know, now, when you think about the satellite church, just think about this, you know, uh, satellite churches through live streaming and all that. You think about one person preaching in one church. Maybe there are several hundred, maybe thousand people, some thousand people in front of him. He's preaching to them. He's their pastor. Now, that is live streamed into, you know, let's say, X number of locations. And there are people sitting there. And they're listening to this person. Suddenly, the, the, this one person becomes the center of everything. Yeah. And um, they are seeing this person coming to them on the screen. And he and just depending on how he ministers, he could be ministering very powerfully. Now, thank God, it's a good thing that the word of God is coming into a different city or a different location through using this technology, and people are able to receive the word and all of that. Okay, those are all good things. But the problem and the danger I see here is that the focus becomes on that one person. On that one person. And there have been some cases where that one pastor has become so puffed up, you know. Now, to the point where, you know, okay, so you see, it, I mean, this is a real, real life situation that I'm sharing, which actually happened. But okay, so this church, particular church, the pastor, they had several satellite churches, I forget how many. Um, I think they may, have, they may have grown up to, uh, I don't know, 10, 15 satellite locations. So this one pastor, his message is being, you know, streamed into all of these locations around the country. Now, they have local pastors to, you know, do the pastoral work. They call them campus pastors. But what happened? It, it went into the head of this main pastor. When there was a problem in one of the local campuses, his response was, hey, I am the one in charge, and this campus is happening because of me. You don't have a church. You know, that's how he would speak. And uh, can you imagine the campus pastor, the person who's actually taking care of the people there during the week, the main pastor is telling them, hey, you don't have a church. It's my church. You know, and that was the attitude. Now, of course, that whole ministry disintegrated, but that's kind of what happened. You know, it just put, puts too much power into one person's head, and it. This is what the result was. I'm not saying every 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 time it's going to happen like this, but I'm just saying this is a danger we must be very careful of. And the next point is, I, I can see. Uh, the comments on the chat by Kennedy and also by Elisha that in these satellite churches, of course, the caring for the spiritual people is taken is is done by you know local people, the campus pastor and so on. But it does not provide opportunity to raise up other leaders, you know, because it's that one pastor from the main church being beamed into all these other locations. Everybody's listening to the main pastor or whoever is preaching in the main church. So the local church pastors, they don't get too much opportunity, really. And so, you know, they're not a, there's no opportunity for them to preach and minister and so on. So that was that's, again, a downside uh, to, to this live streaming experience. So while there are positives in this whole thing, we have to be mindful of some of the negatives that we've said. Don't let the focus shift on the, 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 you know, the media experience. Keep the focus on worship, on the word, and the ministry of the spirit. Use media and technology in the gathering place 
to support or supplement or support the ministry. Uh, when we are doing satellite churches and all that, be careful that the attention remains on Jesus, not on the main person. Uh, give opportunity to raise up leaders uh, and uh, use it, use this whenever it's needed, but always think of building people up and raising leaders up, right? So these are some things I would just um, share here in how the gathering place has changed. Uh, um, if there are no more thoughts, we can jump into the next lesson. Uh, any thoughts on the lesson five about the gathering place? Um, Shri Kumar, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, sir. Uh, I just want to add one more thing, like as we discussed. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I feel that um, yes, but whatever the, the whatever we discussed, that is very true. But also, uh, we should not miss this, um, you know, the, the physical meeting because I feel that um, you know that actually uh, brings accountability in in each one of our life like you know, we are accountable to the pastor the pastor is accountable to the to the to the to the people mm. because in the online they, he is not knowing that uh, who is his who is his church people and uh, and also there are problem like uh, like now yes we, it is comfortable for us and we can watch uh, anytime according to our convenience but um, but in the Sunday service, when if it is, um, you know, it's a physical location, the pastor will be able to know that, or the other care cell members will know that whether this fellow person was there or not. All mm. those things, there is an accountability will always be there. And that is always good because uh, that can always, you know, uh, build the fellowship. So that is one thing I just wanted to add. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you. All right. Let's see how much we can do. Um, and this next topic, which is about worship, okay? So I'm trying to just move fast here, so I will cover more ground. Uh, think about how worship has changed, right? So we have in the Old Testament, there was, you know, the, I think the first record for us is about when the people of Israel, they crossed the Red Sea, you had uh, Moses singing and others, Miriam and other people, they're all singing and dancing with tambourines and prophesying, worshiping God, praising him for the mighty things he had done. Then there was worship in the Old Testament tabernacle and temple. You know, they came in and we, like we mentioned earlier, David had set up these amazing worshipers and so on. We are worship in the New Testament. There was singing in, in the synagogue and in the early church worship, we see in the writings of the New Testament, Paul says, you know, sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So they had that kind of worship, which would happen at homes or in the synagogues. And then some of the highlights as we journey through time, you know, there was a church org organ music introduced around 780, play the organ, and some in some churches that still happens. Uh, then there was a chanting type, which again was, I mean, this was more introduced by the Roman Catholic Church, where it, you know, there would be a response, a kind of a responsive type of worship. The priest and the congregation would, 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 they would say things one after the other. Then came the hymns, the writing of hymns, uh, which was, uh, you know, during the 1500s, 16th century. Uh, the main proponents there were Martin Luther, John Calvin. They encouraged people to write hymns based on scripture. Uh, the emphasis was it should be on scripture. And, uh, and uh, you know, Calvin was uh, so strict about that. He only wanted scripture words to be included, you know. And so, so that's why some of the hymns that we have are very, very, very strong in the word of God. Because they wanted... You know, the, 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 the thing was, you have to use scripture in your songs. So that was on the, and, and, and today we are still singing many of those hymns. Those hymns are still being sung today, so very powerful. So that started off around the 1500s. And then, you know, there was uh, most notably the German composer, the, the music that was written was actually an expression of scripture, you know. Bible verses, so we, uh, you know, we, we today we, we call them as cantatas, but basically it was scripture put to music to express worship towards God, right? Um, and then we had the revivals happening. So in the revivals came out those songs of revival. Uh, uh, these were what we would call as choruses, 
uh, you know, the songs that were sung in simple, ordinary people in simple settings, clapping hands as part of the revival movements that happened. And then we had the choir, the gospel choir, the gospel music, gospel choir in the 1900s that evolved uh, and all of that. But, you know, up until this time, nobody used uh, drums and, you know, the, the rock kind of music happening that never entered the church. Uh, the music was always very formal, very, you know, uh, simple. But in the 1960s, the, things changed. Things changed. Uh, it all began with, you know, the, the Jesus movement. Uh, then the second half of the 60s, early 70s, where uh, a lot of the people who were into drugs and that alternate culture began to come to Jesus Christ. Uh, primarily, uh, the person who was you know, God used at that time, Chuck Smith, he uh, he established the Calvary Chapel. So now these people were all into rock music, right? That means guitar, heavy, heavy, heavy instruments, and drums and all of that. Now these people come into Christ, and they were not going to be singing the hymns. <laughs> or you know listening to bach or any of that that that's that that was not something they could do so they couldn't go and sit in a you know a regular church service and this is where chuck smith started the calvary chapel and he welcomed this kind of music christian rock so larry norman who was you know from that whole subculture is considered a pioneer of christian rock because he started writing Christian music, uh, uh, putting it in the form of uh, uh, rock music, but Christian songs. Right now, people he is controversial because you know people question about his life, and if, of course he came out of drugs and all of, all of that mess. But he started writing Christian songs with all of these kinds of instruments, and then that style, so called Christian rock. But he was is considered as you know the pioneer, the leader who, who brought about this shift. And of course, Chuck Smith is the pastor who accommodated them. He said, "Hey, in this church, you can play all the guitars you want and the drums you want and sing the way you want, as long as you give your life to Jesus Christ." And so that began what today is known as the contemporary Christian music, where we use all kinds of instruments, and uh, you know so on. And from that Jesus movement came the Vineyard, vineyard movement. Uh, and we, some, we still sing some of their songs. And they started, you know, they built this further, the contemporary Christian music using, uh, you know, Christian rock and that style of music. And then came, you know, many other groups, Hosanna, Integrity, Hillsong, others. And then today, you know, we have all of these well-known bands uh, Christian artists and so on, Bethel and Jesus, Elevation, Jesus Culture, Elevation Worship, so on. And songs are being written. But we've come a long way from hymns that were based on scripture to the kind of songs and music that's being released today, which is so different. Now, of course, uh, music is so important. And um, today's generation connects very differently to music. So having music that appeals to today's generation is, is important. Yet we could be missing out on certain things, right? In the way music has evolved. So I want us to discuss this. Maybe we'll discuss this tomorrow. In what are the pros and cons and the way music is worship music, Christian music is being expressed today. Right? So think about it, you know, this few days back, Maverick City, they won four Grammy Awards uh, in their category, Christian music. Uh, and they're packing up stadiums. You know, with people coming to worship God, and of course, their style of music is very contemporary, very different, and but it's also very meaningful. Uh, 
so there are good things that are happening and yet at the same time we need to be careful about some of the things that could go wrong okay so i'll pause here today we'll just uh, pick up from here i just wanted to cover this so we can discuss this tomorrow and then go into some other topics okay um sorry for rushing on this but we'll we'll pick it up tomorrow may i request somebody to please pray and dismiss us today somebody could pray can you pray this please sasha God, thank you, Lord, for the subject we learned about media and technology. Lord, how the music came about and how everything improved, Lord, as the years passed by. So that we may always uh, reflect to you in everything we do, in our technology, in our any kind of thing that we do, God. Thank you, Lord, for this class. And we pray as our classmates and brothers and sisters, Lord, I pray that they will have a wonderful day remembering. You are the center and the one who matters in every life and situation, God. Thank you, Lord, for Pastor Ashish. We pray your blessing, peace, and uh, your complete uh, healing and everything, Lord. That you are. Uh, thank you for bringing him into our lives so that we will grow in knowing who you are and what you're doing in our life, God. Thank you so much, Lord. In we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. We'll see you all tomorrow. God bless. Bye now. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you, Pastor. God bless you. Thank you. God bless. Bye now.